Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our show today. Uh, if you can just type in when you're joining us from, um, and uh, if you have any questions that would want to be addressed at the end, you can just write in then uh, in the comment section, then you will be able to address them uh, at the end. Today, we are continuing uh, with Blue Belt Financial Skills, uh, crafting your financial independence plan. Stephen Covey says, your economic, economic security does not lie in your job. It lies in your own power to produce, to think, to learn, uh, to create, to adopt, to adapt, and uh, that's true financial independence. It's not having wealth, it's the ability to produce wealth. So today we're continuing with our um, coaching from Temba. Temba is a chartered accountant with more than 24 years of experience in corporate financial management and risk management. He holds an MBA and uh, is a consultant, facilitator, and trainer in risk management, asset and liability management, and investment management. Uh, he has done so for several corporates uh, in 13 African countries. Over a period of 15 years, uh, Temba has done presentations to blue uh, and blue collar and white collar conference audiences. And uh, as we've mentioned before, most importantly today, Temba is uh, presenting as an upcoming author of his book, Manage Your Personal Finances Like a Black Belt. In the book, Temba believes that uh, if you have a stream of income, anyone uh, can retire in five years. And he believes to attain the black belt status in five years, um, one has to have three things, add financial skills, the right mindset or a developed level of consciousness and developed habits. Over to you, Timba. Thank you very much, Tafadzwa, uh, for that presentation. Let me just do something here before I continue. Right, it's done. And um, thank you very much for joining us for yet another installment of um, uh, the personal financial management uh, series. Today, we'll be focusing on the financial independence plan. It's something that we started on last week, but there are things that I would want to add on to the content that we went through um, last week. As we have done previously, I am going to be projecting some slides. Um, because that's what people do when they come. Sometimes it's easier to communicate using slides. So yes, that's my slide deck um, today. So we're going to be talking about you know, a financial independence plan. Um, let me just mention two things before I start. The first thing that I would want to mention is I find it fulfilling to do these coaching sessions mainly because in my personal financial management journey, I have made so many mistakes. And sometimes I use these sessions to communicate with the audience some of the mistakes that I have made uh, along the way. So let me just share with you one of the mistakes that I have made. And it's a mistake that came to me as I was going through my library um, today. The mistake that I have made, which is one of the you know, important and you know, most devastating mistakes that I have made is not to take action. So I remember 10 years ago, I used to be the kind of guy who would be attending seminars on financial independence, seminars on investing, seminars on stock market trading. Have you met those guys who are seminar junkies? They always want to be attending the latest seminar in town. So let me just tell you my story. Years ago, I attended a seminar on stock market trading, and I ended up buying a program. Um, this, this is the material that I got. I don't know if you can see it. 
it was the when professional stock market you know material i bought two such books um of uh, of material of stock market trading um i also went to another seminar i ended up buying similar books but this time on forex uh trading i then attended another seminar on derivatives trading and I ended up buying two similar books on derivative trading. So if you were to come to my library, I've got all these books on stock market trading, derivative trading, um, and property investing. I remember I went to about, you know, at least 10 seminars on, uh, on property investments. But one thing that I have discovered is that I never really took action. I was interested in knowing, but I never really took action. My hope is that after this presentation, you are going to take action because financial independence is not about just accumulating knowledge on the subject. At the end of the day, the people that become financially independent are people who take action. And that is my desire you know, for you, uh, that you take action. The other thing that I want to mention before I start the presentation today is that I do quite a lot of personal financial management coaching and training. And sometimes I'm invited to conferences to talk about personal financial management. One of the things that I'm very careful to do or that I do it as a matter of habit is to ask my audience, how many here have got debt? All right, how many here have got a motor vehicle, finance, um, mortgage? And um, normally, 90% of the audience actually have some kind of debt. Then I ask a second question. How many here actually have a stock market portfolio that they manage on their own or an investment portfolio of property or any other investment for that matter? And guess what happens? less than 10% of my audience actually um, uh, raise you know, their hands. And I find that interesting. I have had an opportunity to do a personal financial management coaching session in Dubai. And I again asked my audience, how many here have got debt? What I, find, what I found very interesting is that the percentages were opposite, right? Um, in some parts of the world, you've got more people who've got investments than they have got debt. In this part of the world, particularly in South Africa, where I'm doing this presentation uh, from, people have gotten used to borrowing and they do very little investment. So one of the second outcomes of this particular coaching session is that you start having an investment portfolio and you prioritize investing. We will talk about what to invest in, but it is really my desire that you start having a kind of an investment portfolio from which you are going to generate uh, passive income. So if we were to come up with two objectives for this coaching section, for this coaching session, objective number one is that you take action. Don't be the kind of person who just wants to accumulate knowledge and you give us feedback and say, the session was interesting, but you never really take action, right? Um, and secondly, be the kind of person that reverses some of the percentages that we are seeing where people tend to be overborrowed than you know, being investors. Um, the thing about South Africa, and some of the countries in this part of the world is that there is very little saving that happened. So in the whole, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes our economy does not grow to the extent to which it should grow is because, you know, people are not saving and there isn't that prioritization on saving. But there is a third objective for today. I would want you to come up with your own financial independence plan. A financial independence plan has to be customized to your circumstances. It's not something that is complicated uh, at all. And hopefully, if I find time, I'll just project on the screen an Excel spreadsheet. And you'll actually see how easy it is to come up with your own financial independence uh, plan. So moving on 
for some of you who've been following us in these coaching sessions, you would know that I used to be a karateka. Um, so, so I used to be a karateka. Um, and, you know, during my time, I learned not only to fight, but I learned how the belt system in karate, you know, works. So for this financial management coaching session, we've sort of adopted um, the way that they do it in the martial arts industry, where they use the belt system to denote increasing level of, you know, competence. And you would have heard me say that at each level, there are certain outcomes that we are aiming for. So when we spoke about the white belt level, I indicated to you that the outcome there is for you to have an income stream. I don't care whether that income stream is passive income or end income. You will not graduate to the yellow belt level until you've got an income stream, right? That's the outcome of the white belt level. The outcome of the yellow belt level is that you need to learn to budget, to prepare a customized you know, budget. And you need to use a budget as a, a, a cost control mechanism, but not only a cost control mechanism, but also as a resource allocation mechanism. So you allocate scarce resources using a budget. I introduced you to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs when we're doing the yellow belt level. I also you know, gave you a rough idea of how you should be doing you know, your budgeting. Two particular things that we mentioned there, number one, I expect you to be saving at least 10% of your income towards uh, investing. And initially, you're going to use that 10% to build an emergency fund. And then over time, you're going to use it to invest. When you get to the blue belt level, you know, at the yellow belt level, you started with 10%. At the blue belt level, you're going to increase that percentage so that it becomes at least 50% right? It's not difficult to do. It can be done. When we were at the yellow belt level, I introduced you to the concept of tithing. I believe, and I don't have to justify myself in this session, you would need to go back to that particular video. You should spend at least 10% of your income to doing good. You know, if you're part of a church, you know, tithe. Um, I totally believe in the, in the discipline of tithing. I also introduced you to a very important ratio, which is to the debt to disposable income ratio. And I said that ratio should be managed very, very well in your budgeting. Then we went to the orange belt level. So you will not graduate to the orange belt level until you have perfected the art of budgeting. At the orange belt level, we introduced you to the concept of building an emergency fund. And I said to you, you should have at least three months worth of expenses in your emergency account. So the guideline is three to six months, right? You know, there are certain people who do not even have an emergency you know, account. Um, you know, that's not a good way of managing personal finances. We also introduced you at the orange belt level to the concept of getting rid of unproductive debt. So you will not get to the green belt level if you've got a clothing account. I don't like clothing accounts. I don't like um, personal loans. I like credit cards as a mechanism for payments. I don't like credit cards for swiping wherever you want to go. So the idea at the orange belt level is for you to get rid of unproductive debt. The only debt that you can carry to the green belt level is a mortgage. Or if you've got debt that is used to finance an appreciating asset. So um, I introduced you to the, law, to the laws of borrowing at the orange belt level. And some of the laws that I introduced you to is never borrow for consumption purposes right? You don't borrow to consume. It's a cardinal financial management mistake. Number two, do not borrow to finance a depreciating asset unless that asset is being used to generate income, right? Those are the fundamental laws of borrowing um, that you need, so, to need to learn. At the green belt level, 
I introduced due to tax optimization. I introduced due to negotiating. So as somebody who wants to be very skillful in personal management um, skills, you need to learn to negotiate, right? Then today we are talking about the blue belt level where I introduced you to the concept of financial independence. In my recap today, I will go over those definition of financial independence for the benefit of people who were not with me uh, last week, and we will look at it. But at the blue belt level, I would want you to craft a financial independence plan and also generate passive income. So when we left the white belt level right up to the blue belt level, the income that you are working with was end income. End income is income that you need to put a lot of effort to earn. Passive income, it's effortless income. Uh, that's the income that will lead you to financial independence. So at the blue belt level, what we would want to do is to introduce you to the concept of passive income so that you are able to generate at least um, one source of you know, passive income. At the brown belt level, we will still continue to talk about passive income, but there we will expand the discussion so that ideally you've got at least seven sources of passive income where you are generating uh, passive income. But we will get there. But for now, what we would want to do is for you to learn to have a financial independence uh, plan. Um, this is the competence framework that we are working with. Uh, I will not spend time to explain the competence framework uh, because I have spent so much time explaining uh, the competence framework. So what is what are we going to talk about today? We've got a presentation that is full of you know quite a lot of content. Um, so what you see there on slide four is my presentation map. I will start with a recap of what we covered last week. I would then want to talk about the seven deadly money management mistakes that people make. By the way, this content, as I have indicated to you, I get it from my own experience. I have made a whole lot of mistakes and I have written a book about some of the mistakes that I have made and some of the knowledge that I have acquired you know, over the years. So I want to talk about the seven deadly money management mistakes. After that, I want to talk about the seven wealth principles. These are the principles that you are going to apply as you build your various investment portfolios. Then I would also want to talk about the seven deadly investment mistakes. They are mistakes that people you know, make. Then after that, I want to talk about the seven investment habits. And then if we find time and if Tafazo will allow us, I just want to do a practical with you where I project an Excel spreadsheet on the, on the screen. And then I will take you through a back of the envelope type of you know, computation for your uh, financial independence you know, plan. So let's start with a recap of what we covered you know, last week. Last week, I introduced you to the concept of passive income. We are talking about two different types of income that you can earn. You can have what is called end income. An example of end income is a salary. For the purposes of personal financial management, a salary is poor quality income. Poor quality income, right? Why? Because if you get sick and you do not report for duty, they are not going to pay you your salary or they can even retrench you. So, so it's a poor source of, you know, um, uh, it's a poor quality source of income. The other second category of income is passive income. Examples of passive income would be things such as dividends, uh, things such as um, uh, rentals from a property investment, you know, portfolio, uh, things such as, uh, have you noticed, I was I was doing a presentation. Uh, I'm just thinking about this as I am presenting to you. I built a system for a particular bank that operates in Swaziland. And as I was doing a presentation to sell this system to them, one particular person asked me, do you charge license fees for your system? That's when I noticed that, look, 
I am forfeiting a very important opportunity here because an example of passive income would be license fees. You know, you, you come up with a brilliant idea and then you charge people license fees for using uh, your system. And, and when that person asked that question, I had to go back to my team and say to them, guys, I think we are at a stage in our business where we have to generate another source of income from license fees. There are certain businesses that generate income from franchise fees. Think of how McDonald's has grown to be the institution that it is over the years. You know, they are able to franchise their ideas. Think of royalties. That's passive income. The good thing about passive income is that it's not income that you have to put some effort to earn. Obviously, there is that initial in, in, in effort that you put in terms of acquiring the asset or in terms of building a particular system from which you are going to benefit through license fees. So some of you tell me stories like, Temba, I don't come from a wealthy family. Is there any possibility under the earth, you know, under the heavens that I will be financially independent? Yes, there is. All you need to do is to come up with a brilliant idea. All you need to do is to start a business. All you need to do is to sell that idea to as many people as possible, be able to franchise that idea. So my advice to you in terms of becoming financially independent, I, I have got a two-step process. Number one, you need to learn to invest before you learn to be an entrepreneur, right? So, so that's why we are talking about investment. And initially, when I teach people about investing, we start with the stock market um, because that's a very simple way of introducing people to investments. So even my children understand that. I have met them to acquire some shares. Um, in fact, part of the education curriculum of some schools is that they even introduce people to the stock exchange. And I was delighted the other day when one of my sons came to me and he was asking me about the stock market and about a system that they had been introduced to. And then that's what I noticed that, oh, some of these schools they've got, they teach people relevant things. You know, you understand. So financial independence is about generating passive income, which is greater than your monthly expenses. So when we talk about financial independence, we are talking about an inequality where the passive income must be greater than your monthly expenses. Here is the important thing that we mentioned last week. As far as passive income is concerned, you need to learn to grow. In some of the equations that I'll be introducing to you, we will use the symbol G to denote growth. And the point that we'll be making here is that your passive income, once you have created it, it must multiply at wealth producing rates of return, right? So, so as an investor, you must be able to understand a return on investment in terms of percentage. So that if I ask you, what is the return on investment on your on your portfolio, you'll be able to answer and say, this is my return. Because the thing about passive income is G. Passive income must grow at wealth producing rates of return. On the other side, as far as monthly expenses are concerned, I introduced you to the F word. The F word is not what you're thinking about. The F word is frugality, frugality. I spoke about being frugal. In fact, we start introducing the concept of frugality at the yellow belt level. For some of you who were with me, when I took you through the yellow belt content, you would have heard me speak about, you must always live below your means, right? Very, very important. I say it to you. If you earn an income of 100 rands, your expenses must not be more than 80 rands. Right, very important. That's, that's about living below your means. So we introduced you to the concept of living below your means at the yellow belt level. Now we are talking about the blue belt level. We are now expanding that concept 
to saying you must be frugal. Frugality is not just about, um, uh, about uh, saving on expenses. It incorporates certain things such as extending the life cycle costs of assets, right? So given a choice, maybe you're making a purchase and you have to choose between asset A and asset B. Asset A costs less, but the lifespan of that asset is one year. Asset B costs more, but the useful life of that asset is five years. The concept of frugality says the life cycle cost of asset B is less than the life cycle cost of asset A. And therefore, even though it might seem that asset B is more expensive now, I will buy asset B because over the useful life of the asset, I am going to pay less for the asset. That's the life cycle cost of, uh, of an asset. But also frugality is about uh, making sure that you value every cent, right? I told you the story about Warren Buffett. I'm not going to repeat that story because I need to rush to cover today's content. But you need to value every cent. I like it very much when I go into a household and I see that even the children in this household are being introduced to a savings jar where they put all the cents, the coins that they collect into a savings jar, right? Because by so doing, you are inculcating within your children that discipline of valuing cents that every cent is very important because if it is invested today, it can grow to an astronomical amount of money, maybe in 400 years, right? That's the concept of time value of money. So that's an aspect of frugality um, um, there. There are so many aspects of frugality that we spoke about, but I'm not going to repeat myself uh, today. Last week, I introduced you to three terms. I introduced you to the concept of financial security. And the most important point that I mentioned there is that don't ever think that you'll be financially independent or you will retire on your pension, right? I gave you so many, because the pension system is meant to give you financial security, not meant to give you financial independence. And therefore, for some of you who have got jobs, what we are talking about today is coming up with an asset base over and above the pension arrangements that you've got at your own company. Because in all likelihood, that pension, when you reach retirement age, is not going to be enough to sustain your, life, your lifetime. And I gave you more than three reasons why that is the situation. Uh, I'm not going to repeat those reasons you know, today. But financial security, is all about having a passive income which covers your basic living expenses. Uh, and that's what pension arrangements are meant to do. When we speak about financial independence, we are talking about a passive income that covers your current lifestyle, right? That's what we are talking about. So in your financial independence plan, you look at your current expenses. You then say to yourself, I want to retire in five years. You put inflation onto that current um, expense base. So that say, for example, your expense base currently is 100 runs. In other words, your expense is 100 runs every month. So what we do when we are crafting a financial independence plan, we then ask you one question. When do you want to retire financially? Some people would say in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. I believe. If you listen carefully to the coaching session that we are presenting today, you can actually retire in five years as long as you've got an income stream. So let's just say your current expenses, your current lifestyle is 100 runs. You want to retire in five years. By in five years' time, 100 runs, when you put inflation to that, will be equivalent to, say, 120 runs. Right. So what it means is that within the next five years, you have to generate 120 rands worth of passive income so that the passive income that you are able to generate in year five will be able to cover 
your inflation adjusted lifestyle today. That's financial independence. If you reach a stage where your current lifestyle adjusted for inflation is covered by your passive income, then you have reached financial uh, independence, right? That's what we are talking about. So let me give you the steps of crafting a financial independence plan. Number one, decide on when you want to retire financially or you want to achieve financial independence. For me, the goal was to do it in five years, all right? And I'm glad I've been able to do it. That's why I had the courage now to write a book and tell people how to actually uh, do it. Now you have decided on a retirement goal, all right? Don't be guided by what people say uh, where they say you need to retire at the age of 65, all right? That's for them. That system of retirement comes from the industrial age. <laughs> it comes from the industrial revolution. Some of you might have heard that we are in the fourth industrial revolution. In the fourth industrial revolution, things work a little bit differently. Have you ever heard that in your, you know, I was reading about the careers of the future and people were saying for, for people who will operate in the fourth industrial revolution, you will have at least seven jobs that you will work on. They call it the gig economy, the gig economy. Maybe you've never heard about it, but you know, sad, you know, you know the, the, the people that we are bringing today, our children will not be loyal to jobs. Our children will not be motivated by pension arrangements of companies. You know, they, they will be motivated by different things. So which means that for their working life, they are not going to be stuck to one particular job is our parents were stuck because those kinds of arrangements were suitable in an industrial revolution that has gone by. So that is why it is important to listen carefully to this coaching because this coaching is appropriate for the industrial age that we are in. It's an industrial age that is characterized by a lot of uncertainty. It's an industrial age that is characterized by a lot of distortions. It's an industrial age that is characterized by a lot of innovation. And one thing that I like about the times that we are living in is that it's possible for somebody with very little capital to start a massive business because of innovations such as the internet, innovations that are coming you know, now and again that you have had people come you know, it's possible. Think of how we are doing this presentation. 10 years ago, I would have had to go to a television station, pay lots of money to be able to, you know, book a slot so that I can present my content. But now I don't have to do that. All I need is a Facebook account and people like Taffy who've got a vision to be able to make this thing happen, right? That's all you need. So what what I like about the age that we are living in is that it has lowered the cost of capital. As long as you are innovative, as long as you've got selling skills, it's possible for you to start a massive business, right? Very, very possible uh, for you to be able to do that. And, and that's the one thing that I like about, you know, this, this, this age that we are in. There are lots of opportunities. If you are seeing risks, uh, that's for you. And one of the things that we train people to do is that within that uncertainty, within that risky environment, there is opportunity. I was reading a report the other day of how many companies made billions during the times of COVID. And it was actually amazing to me how people became, you know, uber wealthy during this COVID period. So yes, it's a risky environment, but there are lots of opportunities is if you've got an eye for opportunity. I also introduced you to the concept of financial freedom. Financial freedom is where we are all aiming for. That's where your passive income covers your ideal lifestyle. Um, so your ideal lifestyle is to be going on holiday, to buy a Ferrari, um, to, to, to live in a mansion. There is one important thing, you know, colleagues that I said last week. Don't finance luxury from end income. 
right? I see people making this fundamental mistake in as far as managing you know, finances uh, are concerned. If you get to a level where your income is much higher than your expenses, use that additional income for investment purposes so that you convert it to passive income. When you reach a level where passive income is greater than your expenses, then you can finance your luxurious lifestyle, lifestyle from passive income. That's my way, that's my advice. Because one of the fundamental mistakes that I made in my money management journey was to borrow money to be able to live in a big house, borrow money to be able to drive a big car. But, that, but I was using end income to do that. You do not want to do that, trust me. You would want to finance your ideal lifestyle using passive income. Let's move on. I introduced you to the state of financial independence. Oh, colleagues, I don't have time today to repeat what I said. Just go to the video, to the to the video uh, for 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 uh, for you know for for last week. But it's all about the asset base. We emphasize the asset base. Let's go into the content of today. That was just a recap of what we covered. I just want to talk to you about the seven deadly money management mistakes. The reason why we are talking about seven deadly money management mistakes is that at the blue belt level, I want you to be an investor. Repeat after me, I am an investor. You need to put an investment mentality. You know, don't say I'm a borrower. You know, at this point, up to blue belt level, you have been borrowing money from everyone. You know, there are people who do not hesitate to borrow money from individuals, from people that they don't know, from machinists. You cannot go to the next level if you've got a borrower's mentality, right? Particularly borrowing for consumption purposes. Repeat after me, I am an investor, because that's what we are aiming for at blue belt level. I would want you to have an investment uh, mentality. For some of you that read the Bible, I normally at this stage, you know, read a scripture from the book of Job. The Bible tells us that Job was a great man from the East. He had so many camels. He had so many animals. Obviously, in his days, he had assets. You know, those camels and all those animals that they are talking about, those are asset classes. If you want to be a great man of our day, you need an asset base. That asset base may not be camels. It could be stocks. You know, he's got a stock portfolio worth so much. He's got a property portfolio worth so much. So if you're aiming to be a great person like Job or to be a great person like, uh, like Abraham, whom the Bible records that he had his own army during his time, then you must have an asset base. And the thing I like about having an asset base is that it helps you to have influence. Repeat after me, I am an investor, right? Because that's what we want to, to, to achieve at the blue belt level. You need to be an investor. You need to have an eye for opportunity. You need to, you need to, by the way, there is a difference between investment and speculation. <laughs> Before I go to the seven deadly money management mistake, let me clarify this. Let me clarify this. An investor has got a long investment time horizon. You are not an investor unless you are able to put your money to work for you for at least five years. If you are the kind of person that is aiming for money to multiply within one year, you are not an investor. You are a speculator. And today I'm not teaching about speculation. So if I look at a person like, um, like Warren Buffett, he is the ultimate investor. He's not a speculator. You know, speculators acquire assets based on sentiment. And those assets do not have a fundamental income stream to support them. Those assets do not have an intrinsic value, right? That's the difference between investment and speculation. So let me give you an example of um, investment and speculation. Have you heard people saying, ah, let's go and invest in Bitcoins? 
I don't, I don't dispute there are people who have made big monies in Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin uh, is a speculation. The reason why we are saying it's a speculation is that you cannot calculate for me the intrinsic value of a Bitcoin. It's actually based on sentiment. It's actually based on sentiment. There is a huge difference between a speculator and an investor. An investor does research. An investor is able to calculate the intrinsic value of their investment. An investor is looking at a long time horizon to grow their, their, their investment. Then I have got people who say to me, Timber, investing in shares is like speculating. It's like betting on horses. No, you are wrong. You are very wrong. Because from as early as 1923, when we had possibly the first stock market crash in the world, we had people like, um, like um, you, know, you know, Warren Buffett's mentor, right? You know, Graham Benjamin, who was able to produce a very thick book, uh, which I recommend you to read, although you might not read it, it's called Security Analysis. And from that book, because that's the content that Warren Buffett has been, you know, um, reading because he went to the same university where this guy was teaching. The reason why I'm saying this to you is so as to convince you that stock market investing is not comparable to betting on horses. Because when you are betting on horses, you are trying to be lucky. When you are trying to be lucky with investment, that's speculating. There are people who have made money as speculators but it's high risk. You may end up losing a lot of money, right? Um, years ago, when I was reading about trading and investing, I got to understand about characters such as Jesse Livermore. You can Google that particular character. He was one of the greatest you know, stock market traders of his time in the 1920s. And then there was a market crash and he ended up committing suicide. Have you heard of people? who commit suicide after they've lost lots of money. Those people are speculators because the difference between speculating and investing is that investing is a sure thing. You've got a stream of income, which you are going to grow over time. You understand the intrinsic value of that asset to the extent to which there is a discrepancy between the price of the asset and the actual intrinsic value of the asset that you have, you can then make buy or sell decision, right? So in investment, we buy undervalued assets because we have done our research, because we know that over time, those assets will grow up in value. When the market is overvaluing those assets, then we sell those assets to the people that do not uh, have information who are speculating. So what you will see is that on a market such as the stock market, you will have both investors and speculators, right? But the odds are that the investors will make money and the speculators will lose money, right? So the point that I was just trying to highlight there is that please don't tell me that stock market investing is like betting on horses. You are wrong, right? Stock market investing is not even comparable to um, investing in cryptocurrencies, you know, for example. Get me right. I'm not saying you must not speculate. I'm only saying, you know, that allocation to your speculative portfolio. I do have a speculative portfolio, by the way, but I don't invest more than 5% of my capital in my speculative portfolio, right? So I've done Bitcoins, I've done cryptocurrencies, but, and I've lost money, but it's only 5% of my overall asset allocation, right? The mistake that people then make is to allocate a sizable portion. Those are the people that end up committing suicide. So asset allocation is something that we'll talk about when we get to the brown belt level. I will teach you how to allocate your portfolio because you know, even with shares, you're right. Sometimes you need a defensive portfolio, you know, depending on what is happening to the market. And so every year, get this, every year, one of the habits that you must get to do every year, now that you're on this coaching journey with me, 
is that you must look at your investment portfolio and make asset allocation decisions, right? We do that, um, you know, at a minimum once a year. Once a year, we also look at our insurance arrangements. You know, there are people who, when they start the year, they do resolutions. I don't like resolutions. I would want you every year to look at your financial independence plan and say, am I on course? Am I not on course? How do I allocate my assets in my asset base? Those are the things that you do every year, not make resolutions that you will not stick to, right? Because what we are talking about is about discipline and commitment to a goal. That's what we are talking about. We're not talking about resolutions that have got no substance to them. We're not talking about dreams that do not have substance to them, right? So our financial independence plan is not a dream. I hope Tafazo will not be upset with me because Tafazo's Facebook page is the dreamer's page. I have no, I've no, I've no qualms with people that dream. All I'm just saying is that put substance to your dream. Put, you know, support your dream with a credible plan. That's all I'm saying, right? If you are dreaming, you know, that's why I made a very important statement. That's why I made a very important statement last week. And the statement that I made is that hope is not a strategy. As far as financial management is concerned, you can't hope that one day I'm going to make it big. You know, there are people who've got this miracle mentality in their heads. They've got this phrase that is continually playing in their heads. One day is one day. One day I'll be... No, 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 no. You cannot be part of my coaching class if you've got that kind of miracle mentality where you are one day, one day I will make it big. One day I will win the lotto. One day, one day is one day. No, 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 no. What we are talking about is a plan, right? A sure plan that you can stick to with commitment. There are people who believe in prayer. I believe in prayer myself. I believe that as you pray, God can give you a plan. God wants you to be committed to a plan. God can give you wisdom. God can give you ideas to start a company. You know, this is where I differ with people who uh, have got this miracle mentality which says, one day I'm going to see a huge amount in my bank account, right? Um, so I will not go there, right? I will not go there so that I do not upset people. Um, Yes, money can be multiplied miraculously. But I also believe that God can give you wisdom. God can give you talents and abilities to be able to be of value to your community and to be able to sell a product, to be able to invest and leave an inheritance for your children. That's what I believe in, right? Um, so let's go to the seven deadly management mistakes. One mistake that people make is not taking action, right? You, you just want to attend coaching sessions because you want to listen to Timber speak. Start today. Start building a portfolio today. You might not get it right, right? Because there is an important statement that we make as far as money management is concerned. And that statement is, it's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market, right? So the earlier you start, the earlier you will put the law of compound if income or compound interest to work on your behalf, right? So it's not about timing the market. You know, there are people who are fixated with the timing the market when they invest in the stock market. No, 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 no. It's not about timing in the market. These principles that we are talking about were established a long time ago, you know, by people such as Graham, you know, Benjamin, who was Warren Buffett's mentor. These are the people who established these principles of compound interest. It was Isaac Newton who said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. So when we are talking about investing, we are talking about putting compound effect to work to our advantage. So if you start too late, a, it's, it's going to be a tough climb. So to me, if you've got a child who is at least 13 years, start them on a portfolio so that by the time they reach the age of 30, they are a millionaire. The earlier they start, the earlier 
you know, so one deadly mistake that people make is getting a lot of knowledge about managing finances, but you do nothing about it. You never start saving, you never embark on any, you know, uh, financial independence endeavor, right? Second money management mistake is financing your lifestyle using debt, right? Uh, I don't have time to go into that, but I'm sure you can realize that it's a, it's a deadly mistake, right? We have made all these deadly mistakes. The third money management mistake is a lack of focus, lack of focus, right? When you craft your financial independence plan, you must be focused, right? What I mean by focus is that you must dedicate at least two hours in a day to work on your plan, right? That's what we mean by focus, um, uh, which means that if you've got a diary, you've got two hours in a day, right, to, to work on your plan. Don't be so busy. You know, the reason why people get to 65 and they haven't retired financially is that they were busy on end income and they were less busy on generating passive income. I have no problem with a person who spends an hour thinking about an idea trying to say, what is it that I can do to the market? What innovative thing that I can do? Do you know, there are very few people in this world who actually allocate time to think. And one of the things that I have learned as an entrepreneur is I've got in my diary, in a day, at least one hour to think, really apply thought and say, do I have an idea? And sometimes, if I cannot generate the idea, I got this idea from a book called um, Grow Rich. You know, um, you know, um, this book, this in this famous book. And the idea was about a masterminding. You know, the concept of masterminding, getting together like-minded people so that they can think and mastermind on ideas. Right. That's my thing. I, have, I don't feel guilty if you come to me and I tell you I'm busy. And then you say, Timber, what I'm doing, I am thinking. I have dedicated that time to think, right? I'm not doing anything because sometimes you think that being busy is a lot of activity. I, 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 you know, I even tell people that I cannot take calls because it's my time to think. And when I think, I action ideas. Because being financially independent is not about theorizing. It's about taking action. That's what we are talking about. Another, uh, another <laughs> mistake that people make is giving up too early. Have you ever heard somebody who says, I invested in shares, I lost everything. I don't want to invest in shares ever in my life. Or I did a business and that business went bankrupt. I don't want to hear anything about businesses. Look. The thing about operating in the fourth industrial revolution is you need resilience. Even when you have got children, teach them to be resilient. <laughs> because the thing about operating in the fourth industrial revolution is that there are too many cave balls. Whatever you might have planned to do may not eventually be what you will realize. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, um, there are certain businesses that I know, you know, in South Africa, because of the July 2021 social unrest that we had, those businesses were wiped out. People looted those businesses. You've got a guy who was working very hard to build a business, and then all his stock is looted, the business is damaged, and those people were not insured. And so I met a guy who says, I will never do business again, because they had had this instance, this incident, uh, which was so unfortunate. Let me just tell you something which is very important. And we will elaborate on this when we get to the brown belt level. Research shows us that every two to three years, a business will have a mission, it will have, will encounter an event which will, which, which, is, which is called, you know, a mission threatening event. In other words, if you are running a business, whether small or big, every two to three years, you are going to have something that will hit your business 
which you need to be prepared for, right? We call those risks extreme risks, right? And one of the things that we are teaching people in risk management uh, these days is to manage extreme risks. And that's the mentality that you must have when you are operating in the fourth industrial revolution. You must have resilience. And we define resilience as the ability to bounce back after you have experienced a life-threatening or, or a mission-threatening event in your business or even to your personal life. And that's the mentality that you must have when you are operating because you might even have things such as geopolitical events, Russia invading Ukraine. Some of you know how that war has upset economies you know, in the world that we live in. You hear me, hear me, because this is one thing that I want to emphasize at the blue belt level. At the blue belt level, we do not accept excuses. You know, there are people who move around with a bag of excuses. They will tell you my business was not successful because of COVID. My life was not successful because of debt. This was not successful at the blue belt level. We do not accept mistakes, right? Hear that. The other thing that I want to emphasize, which I will emphasize as we go on, is that ultimately money management has got two sides to it. Number one, it's strategy. Number two, it's risk management. Even when you are managing a business, you can't just have a strategy and not manage risk. So even investment managers are beginning to realize that managing money is about risk management. If you do not know about risk management, you do not qualify to manage money, full stop, right? Don't tell me I want to invest if you do not understand risk management, because the essence of money management is risk management. Therefore, when you apply the principles of risk management to money management, you are able to make money even when others are not making money, right? The other mistake that many people make is not getting a mentor or not getting coaching. I will not elaborate on that, but get a financial coach. Get an expert to advise you on finances, to train you so that you, you are coached. It's not something that's going to happen. There are skills out there and you need to be coached. Uh, by the way, do you realize that people who perform at the highest level have got a coach of some kind, right? When I understood that I got a business coach. Uh, so I've got a business coach in my business, you know, somebody that coaches me. And even when, you know, it comes to the gym, you know, I'm one person who, you know, has got no discipline in terms of going. So recently I got a personal trainer, somebody who coaches me. I just follow what they do and they say, today we are working out this muscle. And so that person is coaching me. So I've got a personal trainer, I've got a business coach and people who coach me in various areas where you need help. And, you know, accept the same advice when it comes to money management. Um, another deadly mistake is a low level of consciousness. I do not have time to talk about this today. I will elaborate on it next week or the week after uh, because it's part of the framework. You need to have a certain level of consciousness in terms of managing money, right? If you've got a victim mentality, you cannot operate at the blue belt level, right? If you've got, you know, there are people who believe that you need to work hard to make money, right? So in your formula of making money, it's all about working hard. If you are that working hard kind of person, you've got a low level of consciousness. That belongs to the yellow belt. At the blue belt level, it's about leverage. Leverage, understand the word leverage. You are leveraging on other people's efforts. You are leveraging on other people's money. Some of you have read the book, Rich Dead, Poor Dead. Rich Dead, Poor Dead introduces the concept of OPM. By OPM, he talks about other people's money, right? He is saying for you to make progress, it's not about using your own money. It's about using other people's money. And even for you to make progress, it's about using other people's time. So 
a level of consciousness that you must have at the blue belt level is to be able to leverage your offers. You know, when you're building a business, you're not going to do everything yourself. I worry when I see people who are trying to do great things and they are doing it all by themselves. You're not going to do uh, a great thing all by yourself. You need to learn to build a team, leverage on the efforts of the team. You need to learn to be able to raise capital. You need to be able to borrow from a bank, use other people's money, use other people's ideas, right? I'm not talking about abusing other people. I'm talking about legitimately using other people's money because you're not going to get to the brown belt level and to get to financial independent status until you understand the concept of leverage. Leverage. Up to blue belt level, it's all been our own efforts, right? Now, at the blue belt level, you are now beginning to realize that they are 24 hours in a day. And you know what? In those 24 hours in a day, I actually advise people to sleep at least five, six hours a day. If you can get to eight hours a day, that's my advice. The reason why you can sleep six, eight hours a day of the 24 hours is that when you wake up, you are able to leverage your time, employ tools of leverage to multiply your efforts. That's what we are talking about. If you are a person who believes that every minute in a 24 hour day has to be used, I need to be working very hard every other hour, you're not going to be financially independent and you're not going to be financially, you know, you're not going to experience financial freedom. That much I can tell you for free. Because the people that have experienced financial freedom legitimately have understood the power of leverage. They have understood the power of an idea that is leveraged, right? And, and we'll talk about those concepts you know, later on. And then the other deadly mistake that people make is the failure to manage risk. Even on stock market investments, there are risks that we have. Companies can go bankrupt on the stock market. Companies can, 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 in the stock market can crash. You know, for some of you who invest on the stock market, you might have heard of a company called Steinoff. In one day, it lost 90% of its value. That's a huge value destruction. And, and you need to manage risks, right? And we'll talk about that later on. Oh, time is not on my side, you know, here. I've already spent an hour. You know, I don't know if Tafazwa will allow me to do, but maybe what I can do, Tafazwa, for now, is to talk about the seven wealth principles and quickly talk about the seven, you know, deadly investment mistakes and then end it there. And then we'll continue, you know, next week. So what are the wealth, you know, principles? Build an asset base. When you are being financially independent, sacrifice to invest in things that go up in value. The clothes that you are putting on are not an asset. The car that you are driving is not an asset. What we call an asset for the purposes of this coaching session are things that grow up in value, right? That's what we call an asset. We're talking about even things such as paintings, um, rare coins, uh, all of those things that go up in value. So don't show me your fancy car. That's a toy that you have there. It's not an asset. Understand your risk appetite and play to your strength. Have clarity on the easiest way to achieve the desired asset best. Beloveds, it's not about working hard. It's about working smart. It's about employing the tools of leverage to build an asset best. Be on the offensive, not on the defensive. If you are thinking about security too much, there are people that think about security too much. And you know those people, in my experience, they don't experience financial freedom because at some point you need to take risk. Choose investments that are both powerful and stable. What qualifies as an investment? It's something that is powerful, that is stable, right? I will elaborate on those criteria you know, later on. For example, even when it comes to shares, what is the share that you would want to invest on is a solid company that has got a solid brand, solid management team, fundamentals that are good, and it's growing. 
That's a good share to invest in, right? Companies that are branded, companies that have a product that they are selling, right? Um, those are investments. So what qualifies as investments? It could be stocks. It could be, you know, even in stocks, there are stocks that we call speculative stocks because their value goes up and down. So you need to choose investments that are powerful and stable. Here we are talking about things such as high quality rare coins, real estate. I like real estate because in all likelihood, property goes up in value. The other wealth creation principle is about control. The more control you have over an investment, the more you are able to grow that investment and benefit from it, right? And rich dad, poor dad is strong about, is very big about this aspect of control. Very important. Let me now talk about the seven deadly investment mistakes. One deadly investment mistake is believing that you can predict the next market move, right? Uh, the other investment mistake is about the guru belief. You believe that there is a guru out there who can predict the market. I don't teach people to predict the market. The market is pre unpredictable. Believing that inside information is the way to make you know, money. And even a false concept of diversification. There is also what we call the system belief. You know, there are people who believe that there is a system out there that can make you money. Do you know, <laughs> I was telling you about somebody who sold me a system about stock market investment. I can tell you now that they make more money than the people who are actually buying these systems. The person selling a system makes more money than the people that are actually investing in the system. Why do we know that? Uh, years ago, <laughs> I will tell you about this story next week. Let's reserve it for next week. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting story about asset bubbles. You know, sometimes assets are overvalued and then they crash, right? We call that, you know, we refer to that phenomenon as an asset bubble. But I will tell you the story next week. Believing that you need to take big risks to make profits. Believing that what the future will bring. Believing that you know what the future will bring. Those are some of the investment mistakes that people make. Tafadzo, I, I was talking too much. I was hyper today. I'm excited about this subject that I'm talking about. I hope I haven't upset you about your dreams, Tafadzo. I know you're a person who wants to dream, but I was just saying, support your dream with a credible plan. That's what I was all, uh, and that's the thing that I was saying, you know, today. So, you know, don't, don't be upset with that statement. But I don't know if there are any questions, you know, Taffy. Uh, thank you very much, Temba, for a very insightful uh, session. Yes, I am a big, big dreamer, but I'm a dreamer who implements. I take action. I'm sure by now you know that uh, I'm an action person. So, yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good dreamer. Maybe let me put it that, that way. I haven't seen uh, questions, but uh, we've got a question from last week from Tendai Elliot Sigauke. Uh, he say, he asked that uh, if a company intends to close down without telling anyone, but continues on the stock exchange, what happens when you buy such shares? Then the second question was, how easy is it to recover your money from a company under the judicial management? Thank you very much. Uh, was that question from Tendai? You say Tendai. All right, good, good. Tendai, thank you so much for your questions. Those are very, very good questions that you have asked. Before I answer those questions, let's go to what we spoke about today. Investment management is about, ultimately, it's about risk management. Never forget that. You don't just go into a stock blind and hope that it will go up in value. And that's why we do our research. Part of why we are doing lots of research in a particular stock. Next week or the week after next week, I will, I will continue talking about the seven investment habits. One of the seven investment habits that I will talk about is the 
habit of careful research. Investors do research. They don't just invest in a stock and they don't research about that stock. And so the first question was, what happens to companies that don't tell the stock exchange that they are about to fold and then they suddenly fold? So the answer to that question is that it's twofold. You know, I've got a twofold answer to that question. Every credible stock exchange has got what they call stock exchange rules. So if you want to be listed on that stock exchange, you need to abide by certain rules. Um, I don't know if you follow the story of Steinhoff. Um, Steinhoff was a company that broke certain stock exchange rules. And um, you know, the CEO is in trouble. Uh, he's, being he's being prosecuted you know, as we speak in Germany and in other countries. So any management team that has been deceitful and they have broken certain stock market rules will be prosecuted because deceiving investors is, you know, is something that you know, uh, directors can be prosecuted for. Also, as part of company act provisions, you cannot continue trading a company if you are insolvent. So it's a crime for directors to continue trading if the company is insolvent. In terms of South African company law, directors have to do what is called a solvency test and what is called a liquidity test to see whether the company can still pay its liabilities in the future and if the assets of the company are greater than its liabilities. So that's a fiduciary duty that directors you know, uh, need to have. So your greatest defense as an investor, when you invest in um, uh, on the stock market, which has got rules, is that you know, those directors will be prosecuted. And even as an investor, particularly large investors, where you have been deceived, you can actually sue the directors. That's why we have had certain investors uh, who are actually suing um, 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 you know, Steinhoff for the deception that went there you know, at Steinhoff. The second, as the second aspect of the answer is that as an investor, you must apply risk management techniques. So you must do your own research. That's why I advise you every year, do a careful research. And part of the research is to listen to what management is saying, you know, studying the numbers. We'll have a session later on where we go and teach each other about how to interpret financial statements. So every investor who has been trained can interpret financial you know, statements and can even tell that this company is going to be in trouble. If I had time today, I would have told you to, and I told you about the mistakes that I made as an investor, but I also have got successes as an investor. One of my success stories as an investor is that I never invested in Steinhoff because I could see that this company is going to be in trouble. I never invested in African bank because I could see that they, are, they will be in trouble. And the reason I was able to tell that these companies are on the verge of collapse is by just carefully studying the financial statements of the, of the company. So it's possible for an investor to have insight before based on careful research of what may actually happen to a, a company, either by studying the economy, by listening to what management is saying, by studying the numbers and doing you know, careful research. The second question that you asked is, you know, what are the prospects of getting anything from a company that is under judicial uh, management? Uh, you know, look, the, the prospects are very, very you know, small, very, very small. Uh, you would be lucky to get more than 30 cents in a rand or 30 cents in a dollar if a company is going through liquidation or if a company is going in, you know, is going to be in trouble. Um, so yes, you can recover some money, but what tends to happen is that that money will come after a number of years, by which time it would have lost value. And, you know, a number of creditors will put in claims which will, you know, dilute. I'm sure you know what happens in a liquidation or in some of these judicial management you know, uh, stories. Number one, research shows us 
that you know more than 80 to 90 percent of companies that go into judicial management or go into business rescue are actually able to recover from business rescue most of the companies proceed to liquidation right so that's what the research is telling us and even in a liquidation scenario because you are an equity investor you know what a liquidator does is that they will sell the assets of the company and will pay the secured creditors and all the other creditors before they get to the equity investors and by that time nothing is left so that's that's essentially what happens there any other questions Tafadzo? um i don't see any question if i see them later maybe we'll uh, we'll take them uh, over to the next session uh all right. thank you thank thank you very much uh for a very insightful session. And thank you everybody who was following. I hope we were inspired not to be seminar junkies. And I hope uh, you are all challenged to open a portfolio um, so that we, we, we prove to, to Temba that we, we are dreamers who, uh, who act. Thank you very much. I hope I have enjoyed the rest of the weekend. If you want to get hold of us, so you can write me an email at tafazwa, tafazwa.co.za. Or if you want to get hold of Temba, you can check his website, www.duplexinstitute.co.com. Sorry, uh, duplexinstitute.com. Or you can follow or like, subscribe to his YouTube channel, manage your personal finances like a black belt. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support. Cheers.